54. Hello, everyone. This is Jan Kabili and Ron Clifford welcoming you to episode 54 of the Photoshop Show. We are so excited tonight to have one of my favorite people, one of my co workers or colleagues, and that is Chris Orwig. Chris Orwig is our <laughs> key guy. Yay! <laughs> Chris is the guy uh, when it comes to Lightroom and Photoshop and photography. He's a professor, he's a practicer, um, he's a teacher. And so we're really excited to have him tonight. Hi, Chris. How are you? Great. Super fun to get a chance to hang out with you guys. So thanks for the invite. It really is cool. We don't get to talk to each other much because we're both working so much. So it's really neat to see you, Chris. Yeah, likewise. I keep thinking one of these days we need to do something you know, collaborative you know, either a workshop or something. It'd be so fun to do that. Let's do it. I'm ready. I'm on board. But you know what? My schedule is nuts these days. Isn't yours? Yeah, the scheduling is the tricky part. That that's definitely tricky. But you know, some things are worth trying to make happen. So. I agree. I agree. Well, we're going to come back and talk to Chris at length. But before we do, I just want to say hi to my other friends down there. All our regulars. First of all, we have. Mr. Ron Clifford. Hi, Ron. Hello, Jan. It's good to be here. Good to see you. You look great, by the way. I know you were recovering from that surgery, and you look top of the game. Like you really recovered well. So. Oh, that's so nice of you. I don't feel top of the game, but you know, maybe eighty percent. I'm getting there. Okay. Well, eighty percent is pretty good. It's not bad. Most days, if I hit eighty percent, I'm sailing. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so good to see you. You've been. What have you been doing? You've been traveling or something? Uh, yeah, I did a bit of traveling. I, I've been doing a lot of winter trips and really, really dug in this winter and got creative with my winter photography. Took some groups up to the peninsula here in Ontario, the Bruce Peninsula. It's called the World Biosphere Reserve. It's an environmentally sensitive area. And so I've really enjoyed um, really engaging with people and I, that uh, was all a prelude to setting up those workshops for winter because it's hard to get people convinced to go out in winter. But I, I think finally seeing the results, seeing what the results that the, the group has had, um, it's going to be pretty successful next year. That's really cool. I'm sure it will be. Uh, you know, everything you do is. Yours, and your photos are so beautiful. I've been seeing them on Facebook and on Google+. Plus. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, what are they, winter photos, I guess. Is, is it a lake? or? Well, it's, it's, yeah, Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, which is one of the Great Lakes. It's a very large body of water, more like a freshwater ocean, really. But this year was exceptional. Um, for the first time in many, many, many years, uh, it froze to over 90% on all the Great Lakes. And in fact, Lake Huron and Georgian Bay were frozen solid. Hardly ever happens. And so we were able to actually walk out and take photographs from the water side that you normally would only get. Well, you would never get in the winter unless you would go out in a boat. And that would be pretty dangerous <laughs> in February up here. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah it was a great. Careful. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was worth it because some of your photos that I've seen are absolutely gorgeous, and I'm looking forward to seeing more. Thank you. You know, it's funny. I did a workshop um, also in the middle of all of this. <laughs> I also did a live workshop with a bunch of students from uh, University of Denver. We spent a week in Santa Fe, and boy, was that fun. You know, to have those students with you and get to spend a whole week with them and, and also to be in a beautiful, amazing place. It was so wonderful, and I realized how much I missed that live contact and, you know, being out there shooting. And not only do you teach, but you learn every time you do that, don't you? Sorry, that, I was muted. That's totally true. I've never learned more than, than I, or I never learn more than I do when I'm teaching. Yeah. It's, it's a funny two-way street. Teaching is not about me telling you. It's about a, a community, and, and you know how I feel about that here, so... Yeah, I think we all do, and I know we're going to hear something from Chris about that too, because he also teaches at the college level, and I'm sure he has a lot of input on that. But before we talk to Chris, hi, Dave Bell. Hello, Jan. Good to have you back this week. Missed you last week, or <laughs> two weeks ago. Um, anyway, just uh, it's great to see Chris here tonight, and uh, I've been enjoying uh, not frozen stuff here in Napa Valley, but we've been having the the California poppies and the mustard, but uh, fortunately now we're getting some relief to our drought. About looks like seven storms coming through, uh, one after another. So it's nice and wet and drippy out, right the way we need it. 
<laughs> well, good. I'm glad you're enjoying. You live in such a gorgeous place. You're so lucky. Hmm. I do love it here. And I love your photos as well. You know, every one makes me so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know what you said a moment ago. I, I really, I believe that's true too. As as a teacher, I, I learned so much just trying to, you know, just trying to be able to put into words what maybe you've learned inside helps you, I think, more uh, uh, grant, get more even more grounded in in what what you know that you know when you have to explain it to somebody else. Oh yeah, there's a huge difference between knowing and teaching. It's a you know, and some some people don't ever have to teach, and it's enough to know and put it to use in their creative work. But it's another dimension that I don't know. I really love it, mm -hmm. be able to share with people and learn back from them. It's cool. And Erica, what have you been doing these days? I see you down there, all serious. <laughs> Can you hear us? She's trying. Yes, now finally. <laughs> <laughs> no, my husband uh, texted me and it muted you guys and I couldn't get back in. It was weird. So anyway, um, I'm assuming you're asking what I was up to, which is usually yes. the question. And um, I've been shooting um, a lot of events lately. Shot a wedding, shot the La Jolla Music Society, which was a $1,000 plate gala. And that was tons of fun mm -hmm. um, to be able to see all these people dressed up to the nines. And um, it was, yeah, I've been busy having a great time shooting away at events which is my other thing I do besides the underwater and the beach stuff. You sure do a lot of stuff. That's not <laughs> out of control. I, like <laughs> I know how you feel, believe me. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm so happy to see all of you, and I'm very, very happy to see Chris Orwick. So, Chris, what have you been doing lately? And if you don't have anything to say, which I know is like an oxymoron, right? <laughs> I have plenty of questions for you. Yeah, no, it'd be fun to get to the questions, but um, right now I'm working on the Linda.com course, which has been fun, and like you guys were saying, I echo that whole idea that when you teach something, you learn an, an unbelievable amount. You know, and I always go into those, I don't know how it is for you, Jen, but for me, I think I know the content, and then when I go to teach it and put it, you know, record it, I realize I, I know half of what I need, and you learn along the way, so... So anyway, I'm doing that right now, and um, it was spring break last week for my kids and family. We went down to San Diego. Eric and I were talking about that a little bit. Um, I love that area down there, and otherwise, I'm also working on a book project and trying to figure that whole thing out. <laughs> so oh, part be of careful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is really fun. You know, I, I don't know if you know, but I'm working on a book project. It's the first one I've done in many years because okay. it's really hard, right? <laughs> it takes a lot of time. Um, and uh, it's really, really, really interesting. It brings up, you have to go back to different skills, right? And it turns out, for me at least, it's a lot easier to be glib and to be speaking into the microphone than it is to write because when you write you have to be so perfect and so careful and then somebody comes along and sweeps up after you and says you thought you were being perfect but you weren't perfect enough right so be a little careful on a book project <laughs> yeah yes definitely <laughs> yeah yeah so and you also are teaching during the year right yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, my teaching right now is a little bit different, but I have taught a lot over the last 12 years. I've been teaching at Brooks um, full-time. In September of last year, I stepped out of that stream um, mm -hmm. of full-time teaching, and so it's actually been a really refreshing shift for me. Um, I love teaching, and but I, what I realized is, I mean, this will sound kind of odd, but I was spending so much time helping everyone else that there wasn't a lot of time left for me to do my own thing. And so I realized I needed to take a break for that, for their good and for my own, if that makes sense in any way. So um, it's been a really good season um, the last hand four or five months maybe um, to do that. So, so it's been a nice process. No, I totally understand what you mean. I don't know if you know, but you know, I, I also started out in the... Uh, academic world too. Like I was in graduate school and for photography and have taught in all the universities and gone through the whole thing like you have. Not at Brooks, but at more um, kind of artsy places, you know, a little less uh, photography oriented where you had to always make excuses of why photography was art. You had to go through that whole argument in addition to everything else, you know. 
Um, and so I totally understand and how much time it takes to teach uh, in a university or college setting, it's just incredible. It's way beyond just classes, right? Yeah, it is. And it's, you know, there's obviously there's the content, there's kind of creativity, inspiration, but then there's the student themselves and all the things they're going through, whatever it is. You know, a student comes to your office and says, my dad just died. You kind of stop everything and, and you hang out with that student and, and talk about life. and. Um, that obviously relates to photography in some way, but um, it's also just you know human to human um, connection, and so which I love that side of it, you know. Um, but but there is a lot to it. It is there is, but it's great that you're having time to work on your own projects. I, I'm happy for you. You know, I wanted to ask you though, how did you get into this world? Because each of us comes into it in, from such a different place. You know, when we started, you, you've been at it for a long time, as have I, and the others down there. There really wasn't. Um, I mean, there probably wasn't even Photoshop, right? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I tell when my students ask me that question, I tell them I'm our career planner's nightmare um, because the career planner wants you to have this really linear path, which is you study a topic and then you do that thing and you keep going. And my path's been more a bunch of circles, kind of concentric circles that overlapped. Um, so if I had to condense all that, I would say probably maybe two or three points would be my mom's an artist, so she planted that seed. I got hit by a car and was in a lot of pain and then my dad gave me a camera and that helped me get out of my pain and that's kind of how I got into it. There's a lot of other things along the way but it definitely wasn't and still isn't a traditional sort of path um, to, to get to do what I'm doing but I, I can't believe, I mean I'm sure we all agree, all of us, that you kind of can't believe that you get to do this stuff. Um, Looking back, it makes some sense, but back when you're getting into it, it didn't make any sense at all, and you were you were hoping that it would work out. Um, yeah. Can you guys attest to that? Is that true for you guys too? Yeah, I think I think in general, uh, you know, we've learned by engaging in this huge photography community that everybody seems to bring this unique story to how they entered this field of, of photography or retouching or creativity. That almost seemed like it was, it was like the left turn. They thought they were taking the right turn, and, and it turned out to be the left turn. And it's certainly true for me. And you, you put it really well in such a short package. There, it's really great. You know, I really, I always think about when I was young, and uh, I had a cousin who was very intelligent, and he went to, I think he first went to law school, and then he quit, and he went to medical school. And instead of everybody going, wow, what an amazing guy, you know, that he has like the concentric circle career path, right? They went, oh, I don't know, he can't stick to one thing, you know what's going to happen to him, right? <laughs> so <laughs> things, I think that all those people were proven wrong, and those of us who have um, tried out a lot of different things and gone where our heart led and, and went with serendipity when it knocked on the door have profited from it, and I would suggest everybody try that. Yeah. It works. Yeah. So anyway, um, it's so great that you're here, and I would love to talk to you forever um, about all this really important stuff. But sure. of course, we also need to focus on Lightroom. Um, and so I wonder, you have prepared some stuff for us, haven't you, Chris? Yeah, I have. And what I wanted to do was, um, well, I'll pull it up. How about should I do the share screen thing and, okay. and show some of the stuff I have? Let me do that, and we'll see if it works here. Um, I was going to say when you do that, make sure to share uh, a full, if you're on a one monitor or two, share full screen and not just the app window. Okay. That's really important with Adobe sharing. Yeah. Okay. You guys tell me if it's there because I kind of jumped out of that um, that mode. Yeah, now it's there. Now we see the toolbars. Now, okay. The reason that happens is if you share from the window and not full screen, you lose the toolbars. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, so what, like, what I was thinking about is, you know, as I've had this time kind of away from teaching, is this idea that so often when we teach, whether um, it's in Photoshop or Lightroom or photography, we kind of show that a lot of the keepers or the end result, and I want to show process. And so my whole thing is about process. Um, and maybe I'll start in Photoshop, um, and I'll start with, this image, this is one I'm working on today for this Linda.com course, and it's a retouching, 
And this is a friend of mine, Jessica, in the studio. I don't do a lot of studio photography, but I've been experimenting with it, and it's been interesting. And that process, one of the things I've discovered is that it's like, um, so I feel like I've gone from acoustic guitar to electric, <laughs> and I'm so used to playing acoustic, and I know it well, with meaning natural light, but now all of a sudden the electric guitar is sort of overwhelming, but I'm trying to figure it out. And so in this case, the process for me is to try to connect with someone and to get them to relax and to breathe and to just be present. And so I catch a frame, and then afterwards I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, and can you guys see my stuff all right, as far as the image and the all that other stuff? Yes, it looks great. Yeah. Cool. So, um, so yeah. So the retouching, you know, in this case, it's uh, it starts really simple. I'll just zoom way in so we can see it because I know these get small. But um, clean up, um, dealing with that shine, and that was more a mistake, I think, because I was using too specular of a light source, um, and then do some lighting things and some other skin things, and then I experimented with color, and then got to the black and white deal, and so so kind of have this this before and after. And what I find is that the whole process deal in art is so crazy important. Um, and that's maybe why I love lynda.com is because it's this space that allows you to dissect it into these little pieces. And I'm just going to throw open my folders. I think too often our own process is kind of like all of these layers where we're like, oh my gosh. We, we do the work. I don't know about you guys, but I'll, sometimes I'll do the work and it won't even make sense to me what I've done. And if there's some way to organize it, in this one I just ended up using groups, which I like to do when I'm teaching or, or when I'm trying to make sense of it myself. So I kind of have this roadmap. Details, larger details, light, um, some skin work, color, black and white, and that's it. And to realize it takes steps and that all art requires that kind of a process is so huge, so huge. And to grow as an artist, it's to know that there is a process. And so let me jump through a few more. Are you guys good with that? Oh, yeah. Okay. So what I wanted to do is in Lightroom talk a little bit about process from the perspective of showing a few different scenarios. First one's going to be um, some iPhone photos of um, just in my backyard of my two daughters going to feed the chickens. And this is the first image. It's horrible but I think my youngest looks really cute because her big sister dressed her up. She's showing me the toast. She wants to feed the chickens, but my angle's off. I'm not connected. And then she looks at me. I'm like, this is the shot, you know, for me. And then, you know, as far as the Lightroom work, it's really simple. It's a crop and then ba the basic panel, probably just a few little adjustments. I can show you guys those in a second. But then after that, it's like the moment's gone and it kind of unravels and then that's it. And that's the sequence of the photos kind of going to, to feed the chickens. And by the way, isn't she a cutie? Oh my gosh, she's amazing. <laughs> she is so cute. Um, Wait, is she still that young? She is. This was maybe a month ago. Oh, you're uh, so lucky. I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, she's two and a half and big blue eyes and full character. This really doll. Yeah, she does. She looks just like a baby doll. Yeah, yeah, isn't that, isn't that amazing? So, um, and what I think happens is that sometimes we get, you know, myself included, you get lost in the process because, you know, you, you're like, that was such a cute moment and you hit the first image of the set and, like, and you think to yourself, that's not good, not good, that maybe is good, but you have to almost be, you have to have this fight, like this grit to say, wait, this might be good and then you have to commit to it even if it's just a few steps um, to get there, and then there's obviously the sharing side that we all know about. We all see the pictures like this one that someone posts, and and um, and I think what we forget is that there's a before and after each of these moments. And I had this chance to hang out with this uber famous photographer who I'll leave nameless, but he was showing me some of his unedited work, and I was so surprised at how bad it was, and it was kind of a relief and a validation in a way that's like, you know what, we're all in this together as photographers. And um, there are times where our, I think our success rate's higher, but there's, we all are, process is important to all of us as photographers. 
No, like this, this is a huge point for me that we all think that if we see the famous name guy, that he just got those photos right out of the camera. He didn't get them out of the camera. Even yeah. if he is a film photographer, he did a lot of work in the dark room, or she, pardon me, is she. Yeah. And certainly today, uh, those of you who see stuff here on Google Plus, for example, that you think is so much better than yours, I've seen some of the originals. You'd be surprised. Yeah. If you want to see that in live action, last week I did that, or two weeks ago, sorry, I did that demonstration. Yeah. Where I, I took an image that, that I, I was really, truly ready to throw away. And I, I just decided to uh, apply a little bit of artistic license and came up with an image that, that you wouldn't have expected. And so I, I can totally relate to that. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I mean, kind of having that grit and that fight and tenacity is is so huge um, and so I, I want to I'm gonna keep going through a couple others um, this is another one to me it's a beautiful image at one of my favorite places on the coast um, this one as far as how the image is made I'll just kick through the layers really quick but um, and show you the original in just a second the original kind of looked like this a little bit and then but creating a couple versions in Lightroom bringing them both over into Photoshop masking them together so it isn't rocket science and then a few adjustment layers to kind of to, to get the color going and again I think when we see these or even ourselves when we get these photographs which are kind of gifts in a way it's helpful to go back I think and to remember how they happened and I'm going to go quick through these but this was a shoot for a client and it started out with the photo shoot was done and one of the guys had to carry the surfboard back to the car so I, I was the sun had already set but I thought I'm just gonna follow him and so I was tracking with him the photographs weren't really happening but I was just I just knew that something was gonna happen and eventually at this point I said hey can you throw your photo or your surfboard on your head and he said sure and I was trying to arrange myself you know and figure out the composition and for me when I look at these I can almost it was like I was scrambling I was just ah, oh, there's guys. There's a picture here. There's a picture here, and then finally he was getting closer, and I knew I had to get him to turn. He was going to turn the corner, and I was just waiting for the moment, waiting for it. Come on, it's going to happen. I was settling down a little bit, um, but still, it's pretty haphazard. Right here, I knew in my gut something was going to happen, and then this was the photo, and it was the, it was the last picture of the day, and um, and again, the original didn't quite look like this, but. It, the feeling, I wanted to bring that feeling back to what I created. And it took a lot of pictures. Like this one, I don't know how many it took, what, 25 or 30 to get. Um, but that's a lot of what our craft is. And I think sometimes people will feel bad they shoot too much or they shoot too little. I know I go through those phases where sometimes I try to do more and less, but the I think the point is fight. you got to fight for it. you got to really want it. You know, And if you know we could almost go again and again. Let me just show a couple more. Another one. I got a new camera, that Fuji X100S. I was all excited. I'm in Mammoth with my daughter and her best friend. I'm shooting it. I can't figure out the exposure controls. I finally figure it out. I correct the image. It's beautiful, but then everything else surrounding it isn't. It's not good at all, and it doesn't really capture the moment. Um, but it's, again, whether it's fighting with your camera or with the moment, it's looking for those little those little scenarios and um, and maybe a couple more here just because I think this kind of stuff's interesting at least to me um, this is in Big Sur for a client the sun had set or was about to set and I asked these people I said go walk over there and they're like what are you crazy and I just said just, just cruise over there and they went over there and, it, and at first like right now you can tell they're not into the moment at all they're like Chris what are we doing I said just put up your hands or like be alive soak it up this is amazing and so they started to get into it a little bit and so I think some good pictures take uh, a bit of choreographing and again I'm sort of looking and waiting and hoping and kind of my heart's pounding looking for the moment and it's getting closer and for me this I think is the closest to it um, and as I was shooting, I was thinking of Henry Miller in his book Big Sur, and this is a quote by him. 
which is develop an interest in life as you see it, the people, the things, the literature, the music, the world is so rich, throbbing with rich tre treasures, beautiful souls and interesting people, forget yourself. And I love that, you know, and that's what I was trying to capture. I wasn't trying to capture a sunset, I wasn't, I was trying to capture essence and humanity and beautiful souls and interesting people. And the, the shoot progressed, they walked away, I asked one of them, I said, stand by yourself, because I also like the sense of uh, isolation, and then I think, you know, this is the, the last photo of that, of that particular moment. Um, so there may be two photos in that, in that little deal, but that's what, awesome, rocking out, woo! Um, <laughs> That's kind of what really matters, you know, and, and that it, it takes that process to, uh, to get to those moments. And to be a good photographer, it's having that commitment to go there. Okay. And other stuff I could show, too, and I just, let me just do one little thing to kind of give a sense of how this works, is original photo and then after Lightroom. And for me, a lot of Lightroom and Photoshop is... It isn't about the tool. Um, it isn't about Lightroom. It isn't about Photoshop. It's about an emotion, an idea, a feeling, and trying to get the tool to to help you convey that. Um, and so, in this case, it's super simple. Um, let me just bring back the panels. Some basic adjustments, and then for the sun, this kind of a look. The magic, I think, is split toning, where you just bring. Um, color in your highlights and shadows and get back to the feeling you had when the sun was setting. Um, it's not realism, it's, it's more emotion. So anyway, that's, that's a big part of my, my, uh, my thing and I have, I have a couple more it would be fun to show but I also want to, because I've been kind of rambling here a little bit, let you guys get a chance to either shout out a question or just say, Chris, keep going, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do yeah, it. No, I think we're saying keep going, because this is, I mean, we love this. We love to see the process, the thought behind the final image, because like you say, we all are on this journey to be the best we can be, and we forget that other people are in the same struggle. Even the people we look at as our heroes are doing the same thing. They're yeah. just maybe at a little different level, but they're doing the same thing. Yeah, but you know what, Ron? I see that Erica is busting to ask Chris something. And I know you do a lot of the similar photography, well, right? Well, that's what I was going to say. Is I just wanted to add that sometimes I'll go to the beach and I'm trying to capture that exact feeling, just like you are. I'm trying to capture yeah. the emotion and the feeling. And sometimes I'll take 800 pictures in an hour of, of the beach with, you know, people. And right. I will like one image out of that entire, you know, 800 photos. I'll take one. And so right. just saying that, you know, as you said, not every image is going to be a winner, but when you're trying to feel for that emotion, you're waiting for that exact frame that matches the emotion you're going for. So, yeah, I'm just saying, yeah. I want to say, I agree. <laughs> yes, yeah, and the trick obviously isn't Photoshop or photography. I mean, you have to know those things really well, incredibly well, but the trick is having the gut, the intuition, or whatever it is, the instinct to say, this is it, this is the one. I'm committing to this frame um, and, and to see it through because, um, I don't know, you know, the more photos we shoot, which we all shoot a lot, the tougher it is to find those ones that are really good and, and the more fight it requires. Um, you know, I would imagine it's double hard when you have another human being in the photo. I think a lot of people love to go out in the landscape and shoot because it's a personal, private moment and, you yeah. know, nothing is moving around and you can just do everything yourself. How is it when you have a model there or, or a friend or whoever you're using in your photos? Yeah, for me, um, Rodney Smith's one of my mentors and someone I appreciate and like a lot. Um, he said, I, I used to think, you know, working with models is so strange. And he said, Chris, you can turn a model into a person. I thought, that is so profound. And, it, and the first thing he says to models is, I don't want you to model. I want you to be you. It, and so, for me, whether it's a friend or someone who is um, is a model, it's getting to that to the core of the person. You know, even if it's and Eric, I'm sure you experience this when it's you photograph a family. You know, it's almost worse when they're not models because they're like, oh, how should I look and what should I do? And it's just like, just be you. You know, <laughs> that's what we want. That's what matters. Like the fake version of you is is nowhere as good as the real version of you. And, and so. 
trying to get to that is is at least for me, you know, that's that's what it's really about. And you know, honestly, for me, I can sort of see who's a model and who's a who's a friend or a person. And I think it must be easier with friends that they are more relaxed. Perhaps they're not as worried about how they appear. I could be wrong. Um, I don't know. I don't use a lot of people in my photography, and I, the reason I don't do it is just because. I don't want to have to chase them around for the model permission so that I can use them in my Linda courses and my books. <laughs> Holy <laughs> selfish. Uh, <laughs> There's apps for it. Carry your model releases with you to have yeah, them. I carry them with me now. I, 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 can, I, I was talking to someone about that just tonight, about the fact that when I, I, sh I shouldn't, it sounds weird, I've shot a lot of people in my life, but <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, I, I've done a lot of people photography in my life, and what I've learned over the years is that the first few minutes, maybe ten minutes or so, is is the time frame that you're given to get the camera out of the way. At first, there's a camera between you, and as you begin to learn how to talk and create a conversation with somebody, the camera disappears. And it's when the camera disappears that the magic happens. And and that's that's I think it's a learned skill. I don't think it comes naturally to everybody. Yeah, I think you're onto something there. Um, the camera. You know, and I think the camera can actually, you know, allow us to see more deeply. We all kind of know that. Um, so it is trying to figure out how to, at least for me with people, minimize the camera, maximize the connection, and at the end of the day, be willing to say, you know what, um, I, I didn't get the shot, but I did make the connection, and that's okay. And, and that's my priority. Um, which sounds kind of strange <laughs> when you're a photographer. It should the priority should be the shot, but my priority is the person. And sometimes that means I lose shots, and and I'm kind of okay with that because I would rather have real connection than like a produced fake shot that um, I don't know that just doesn't do anything for me later or for them for that matter or for the client. Well, it totally worked in that case. Who was that guy? Okay, the beard guy. Yeah, let me show the beard guy real quick. I didn't realize my screen was still going, but that's cool. Cause I, um, so this guy, Johnny, we met because we were talking about, we shared an interest in Steinbeck, the author. And um, this was kind of some of the final steps in sort of working on the picture. And a really cool guy. I mean, he has an awesome beard, too. Um, but I wanted to, well, let me just show kind of the shoot. In this case, I think I got about a third of the images are good, but these are sort of all the photos. And a lot of the ways I'm trying to, to capture someone is to talk with them while I'm shooting. So what that means is I'll get a lot of moments, you know, it, while their mouth is open or like this one, it doesn't work. Um, but I like, I like dialoguing about something and eventually getting somewhere. So in this case, there was a doorway. I love, you know, the, the light, almost like if you have a garage and someone steps into the garage. And I love the light. And in this case, I had him step in there, and it wasn't working. I don't know why, but I was trying, and we were talking. But I knew that there was something there, you know, and that's what you got to do. You have to fight for that, what you know is, is to be true. And there's a lot of photographers who will tell you that Walker Evans or different people who said at first everyone thought I was taking snapshots, but I knew there were more. You kind of got to have that internal drive. Put the hat back on, look down. And this is something I'll do with people a lot. Is I say, hey, look down and look away. Just let's just let's just take a break and then look back up. You know, and this you know is the shot. And it, it goes from here to Lightroom is here and then Photoshop is here. And that's a really important process for me. Um, I don't know why I'm doing these small. Let me do them bigger. But so this is original. This is Lightroom. A little bit of cropping. A little bit of color and tone. And then for me, Photoshop is that is the magic. And and without the magic, it's okay. Um, let me jump back to Photoshop. Let me get into this image. Um, sorry about that. Um, it's okay, but but it's really just these last little touches that help out. And it's thinking about iteration. Like I tried to remove his logo off the top of his hat up here, and it just looked kind of weird. Um, so I left it in as part of his personality. Um, and I think I could crop the image maybe almost like this, and it would even be cool. 
But um, again, I think the point more is is process, right? And 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 being committed to that because this image, if I were honest with myself, or maybe if I were in a negative mode, I would say it's not even good at all. What am I doing? But I said no. There's something here. What's the problem? It was color. Get rid of the color. The light. There's brightness was an issue. Then there's some other issues. It's about his eyes. It's about his connection. You know, the guy's a really deep thinker, fascinating person. He's a winemaker and kind of this uh, really brilliant type of a person. Um, reads a ton. Anyway, um, and so it's that, again the process. You know, um, and and there's so many of things like this which I don't need to hammer again and again. So maybe I'll exit out of sharing my screen so we can see other people's faces. But I think. As I was preparing for all of this, um, my thought was, um, and let's see, how do I get out of screen share here? Um, you got it. You, you am I out? Successful. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, is uh, you know, and this is a message to myself, and then the people I'm I'm working with is is to know that, and to know that the the creative process starts sometimes with an idea or a sketch or something you iterate, you pursue, you dig, and then often you find. And if you find, it's like this beautiful, wonderful gift, and people gather around to share and celebrate that gift with you, you know, and that's all the liking and all that kind of stuff that happens um, and community building. Um, but to not just celebrate that, you know, to celebrate the process and to celebrate all those bad photos. Um, and the journey there, because unless we do that, I think even as a photographer myself, I forget that. I forget every time I've created a good image, there's been bad ones before it and bad ones after it. Every time. And if I can go into a shoot knowing that, I let myself off the hook. Um, and there's times when I review my photos and I've actually wept because I've like, oh my gosh, I was photographing this person who is so significant and I missed the shot. Yeah. And then a week later, I looked at him and realized I hadn't. You know, it was just that I kind of gave up on my images and myself in that moment and said, you know, no, there's something here. I just got to look for it or maybe work or crop or whatever. Um, so anyway, that's really, that's really what, what um, I wanted to bring to the table. I'd love to hear your guys' perspectives because I'm sure there's a lot there too. And, um, I'm gonna say I love, yeah, I loved what you, you were saying. I mean, something that always happens is, is especially you're talking about the surfer, then you were talking about the, uh, uh, and the, the gentleman with the beard. You said John was his name? Um, Johnny, yeah. You, as a photographer, I get this, and, and I, 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 I can really resonate. You, you've talked to me about that process where you know you can feel something's about to happen. You just keep taking pictures. It doesn't matter if they're looking and they're not looking or, or things are going or they're not going. You know in your heart of hearts there's something about to take place. And, and you can't put words to it, but that comes from shooting. That comes from being in that situation enough times to know what's going to happen. Yeah, well said. I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, I had so many thoughts when I was listening to you. Um, one was something that I learned um, when I, before any of this happened to me, when I just did photography as a regular person on the side because I thought it was so amazingly fun. Yeah. And I took a workshop from this woman who was a National Geographic photographer. What a gift, you know, what a great opportunity. And, uh, you know, she sent us out to do some assignment, which I did, and then brought our, our slides in those days into the workshop and put them out on the light table. And she said, all right, edit through them and give me only the best. And so like everybody else, I picked out, I don't know, 12, 13 slides or something. And then she came over and took my 12 or 13 slides and without even hesitation, just like boom, 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 threw most of them off to the side and ended up with two sitting there on the light table. And I was, of course, you know, just devastated. I thought, oh, I'm just the worst photographer ever. But then I realized she was doing that with everybody. And that was a lesson I really took to heart, that this is the way it is with photography. Of course, most of your photos, the vast majority, will be not keepers. Just a couple will be. And I think that's kind of what you were getting at. You can't come down on yourself for that. That's the way it is. Right, right. And that's even... That's the beauty of our craft, you know, it's the, um, you know, whatever the analogy is, but it's, you know, the, I'm trying to think of, 
who is it, Hemingway, you know, write the story, then throw out all the, li the good lines and see if it still works, you know, or it's the poet who reduces it, or, you know, we start with, some, or it's the sculptor who has the rock and then whittle, you know, carves it down or whatever, but that's our craft. And too often our industry and ourselves, we, we focus on the end result, rightly so, that's the beautiful thing, but I think the teaching side of me too is like, well, no, there's process. And that process could have to do with, you know, what happened to you that day or what's happening deep in your life, what happened a long time ago, but bringing all that forward is the good stuff. And that eventually leads to the keepers. Um, and if you can commit to the process um, in that way. I've also learned that the more I get into it, the harsher critic I am of myself. And sure. so I'm having less keepers than yeah, I yeah. was before. And that's okay because yeah. I'm pushing myself harder and further than I could have ever imagined. But yet, mm -hmm. before when I was having, you know, a good day, I'd have, you know, a certain number of pictures. And now I come back and I'm, I'm thrilled if I get three to five images that I love yeah. from a shoot. Right. So, I mean, there, there's plenty, plenty more that are good enough to give to a client. But for my personal goal is just basically three images that really speak to me. Yes. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking, Chris, is this idea process um, extends so far beyond the actual shoot. At least it always has for me. For me, the shoot was just the beginning. And then it was that waiting a week or two and looking back at the photos as you described and seeing the ones that spoke to me and what can I do with those. Those are just the raw materials. Think of all the amazing things you can do beyond just making a photograph look good, using it as raw material in an art piece and, you know, taking it to the next level and making transfers from it and doing gum bichromates or whatever your thing is, you know, taking it as a, a tool or, or a, I don't know, a, a raw material, I guess, for making art. Yeah, yeah, and the, the image too, like what I find, I'm sure we've all found this, there's some images you think are amazing and you print them big and they don't work big. And then you print it small and you realize, oh, that's perfect, you know. Um, and the, the process, it, it is iterative, I think, and it, it's exploratory. And that's why Lightroom and Photoshop and all these tools work so well because you can say, well, what if I, what if I warm it up? What if I cool it down? Well, what if I do neither? Maybe what it needs is contrast. And then that's the, the missing link. And so you're right. I mean, it is, you know, it is, it is all part of this, this process. And... I think the more to, more we can embrace it, the better. Um, and that, for me, is why, you know, the whole tool thing, Photoshop Lightroom, is so important because it's, again, it's not about the tools. Um, you know, like occasionally I'll have people introduce me as a Photoshop expert or something, and, and I'm okay with that externally, but internally I always say, no, that's not me. Um, I, I'm someone who wants to create images that have meaning, connection, authenticity, and depth. That's what I want to be an expert at. I just happen to use Photoshop because that's the best tool to get there. Um, so that reminds me, we, we, uh, and we will be again soon, we had and we'll have John Paul Capenegro on the show. Yeah. And he's a brilliant artist. And, and one of the yeah. things that I caught me right away about um, him was he doesn't say John Paul Capenegro photographer. You won't see that. You see fine artist. He doesn't pigeonhole himself as a photographer but a fine artist. And then to hear him talk, and express very much like you're expressing now the process of creating you realize right away he's not a Photoshop expert he's not a photographer yeah. he's an artist yeah. yeah and that would that would be cutting him so short I mean he's so much more than that and I think and John Paul's a good friend one of the things he does an amazing way in his workshops is he he the way he helps other people navigate the process because the trick is we've all experienced this or at least I have you show people photos, the ones maybe that aren't keepers, and they say, oh, and, and they just rail on you, or, or they're really harsh in their critique in a negative way. John Paul isn't like that. He's more someone who's, who, who helps find the ones, kind of like you were saying, Jan, like, well, these are good, and here's why. Let's go in this direction. Um, and he has a unique, he's an artist not only in his photographs, but he's an artist as a teacher. And that is amazing. It's amazing to see him teach and to see him help people discover their voice. Um, I, yeah. One of the experiences I get from him is his economy of words. He really, really mm -hmm. nails it fast with you creatively when, he, when you're referring to your work. And 
you yeah. know, really gifted that way. As I'm sure you are, just from listening to you, I would, I would love to sit in a room for hours and just discuss this, but um, that we're okay. not allowed that privilege so, right now. So. And you know, Chris, I know we don't have a lot of conversations, but I'm, I constantly look at your work, um, and I feel like I know you through your work, and that's interesting too, don't you think? That I can see the, the photographs that you really care about, and from that, I, I don't know, I think I see the ones you care about. And from that, I feel like I can know you. And that is very interesting also, how your photographs can almost stand in for you in a way um, and speak your voice if you are really, really putting your heart and soul into them. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think the best photographs, you know, from my mentors and everything, they're the most autobiographical. And I think for me, that is, you know, kind of the goal. And I think that's true in, with most art, you know, whether it's a writer that you feel like, you're not just writing about a topic, but you're, you're, there's a connection there um, with them. And John Paul's like that. You know, you see his work and you you understand him. If you hadn't met him, if you were to show up, you would say, "Okay, I get it. I, I know. I understand him just through that." So yeah. So thank you, Jan. Though that's a huge compliment, and I love your work too. I mean, I think your training is and teaching is so crisp and clean and refreshing. I watch it and I think. You know, when you, Rob, or Ron, sorry, you're talking about the economy of words. I think Jen is so good with her words. I have to get rid of all my clutter. So, anyway, I love your stuff too. <laughs> Thank you. You're very nice. But actually, that's my passion. I've realized over the years, I love making things. And it was, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I used to be a lawyer for many years. And I didn't even know I had a creative side. And when I discovered it, oh my gosh, how fun was that? But honestly, honestly, my real passion is the teaching part and enabling other people to do this. And I think that a lot of us who do know how to do it kind of assume that everybody else does. And everyone's embarrassed to ask, and nobody wants to insult other people by saying, do you really know? And so there are these huge gaps. So yeah. to the extent that I can help people, I see it as almost like a... I don't know, a service, helping helping so many people get to where they need to be to participate in what's going on now in the art world or just in the world of communicating through imagery, which is so important even for non-artists now. Yeah, and we know yeah. that on the show, you're, you're constantly not afraid to bring up questions uh, for the audience's behalf that they're, we're thinking, but we're just not, you know, asking. We, we don't want to... We don't want to be isolated or centered out as, as not knowing something. And so we really appreciate that from you. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. Yeah, Jan, your, your creativity is contagious in your teaching. It's great. Oh, I'm so glad I stopped being a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> that was about, I'm glad you're trying new things too, Chris. I mean, that's, you know, the wonderfulness of our world, that there are all these great new opportunities. Um, things are changing so fast. There's something for everyone now. Yeah, and there's a lot of people to learn from. You know, um, I learned a ton from my students. We, we kind of touched on that topic before from teaching, and you learn a lot when you teach, and the students teach you a lot. And I think there are a lot of different um, teachers out there, and it's fun to, uh, to learn from them, whatever their age or their interest, whether it's, I mean, um, Erica seeing your low tide stuff makes me, just desperately want to go and shoot photos like that. So even picking that up from you, um, you know, and that's the beauty of it. Like you said, um, there there is a lot out there to learn, and, and a lot of different ways we can all grow and whatnot. So, well, I'm particularly jealous of three of you who are in California. You don't understand what it's like to try to shoot photos when, like, eight months a year, everything is brown <laughs> or white. <laughs> You're so lucky. Yeah, to yeah. Have that beach and that sunset and all. Oh, but I'm jealous of what you've got. I realized I didn't use my time wisely when I was living in New Mexico. Mm. So. Well, you know, I'm telling you, you guys got to get to Santa Fe. If you have, well, I know you've been, Erica. Have you been, Chris? No, I would love to to go there sometime. It's outrageous. I mean, it's like an art sinkhole. <laughs> you can't get away from it. It's everywhere, and it just gets you all excited. Every day you have to jump out of bed and see what there is to see and shoot more photos and make more things, and it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, anyway, I think we're just about coming to the end of our time, so I want to see if there's anybody has something they've been holding in, they just want to say. There's a question in the uh, chat room. Actually, kind of, uh, I was asked, had kind of the same same thought myself uh, from uh, Gary asks, uh, does Chris ever delete anything? 
Will he go back months, years later to see if his shots, to see if he sees his shots in a different light? And I kind of follow on with that. What, 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 as we're taking so many more photos these days, we have we have a lot. You know, we hopefully get some more good ones, but we have a lot more bad ones too. What, uh, what sort of workflow do you use for all of those? What you know, what you think are bad photos to today? Yeah, I I had something I was going to show on that Lightroom. I didn't get to it, but um, I use collections to separate things out, so I can have a collection where I have you know, let's say the 300 photos from the shoot, and then round one is, you know, just, uh, you know, it's probably 150 photos is about half, and then round two is a little bit less. And there are certainly photos I delete, um, and I feel like that's an important process of kind of, you know, taking a stand and saying, you know, this one isn't good. But there are the times, like you said, where you go back, you give it a little bit of time, and you can discover things almost like, I, I think it's the more subtle photographs that are stronger and you notice the more obvious ones too early, or at least I do. Um, so I, I, I do give myself that breathing room and I do try to use collections though to, to clear away all the clutter, all the everything that's distracting me and say, okay, this is what I'm going to work with. Yeah, every once in a while I, I dig back into those other, those other folders or collections and often you know, you find you find kind of those those quiet, beautiful photographs, not the ones that are screaming for your attention. Um, and often, those are the ones I like more. Um, so yeah, so yes and no. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know if that answers the question. But. Anything else from the chat room that we should pay attention to, Dave? Um, no, just a lot of good comments. Just uh, people enjoying enjoying the show. So, uh, I mean, fortunately, I guess drive space is getting cheaper and cheaper, but uh, I guess we just keep getting more and more drives <laughs> and to, to store all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. yeah and, I think and, and, then, and then your backup, uh, you know, becomes, has to come into play there as well. Uh, yeah, and, and I think with that, too, I'm not necessarily saying we should shoot a ton. I still shoot with film, and I do that because it costs a lot of money, and I think, you know, and sometimes I'll shoot a sheet of film that I, I know, you know, there's times where it's like each click cost me $25 because of the particular film I was using, so I have to be committed, or I have 12 shots and that's it. I have one roll of film and I'm photographing someone, and so I'm not advocating just, you know, kind of the spray and pray and hope it turns out, um, but I, I do like what one of my colleagues at Brooks says, who's a National Geographic photographer, who says that, you know, if you're going to shoot a location the first day you do the postcard shots, the second day you do that work of a photographer, or if you only have an hour, the first 20 minutes is the postcard shot, and then the rest of the time is the work of a photographer. Or for me as a portrait artist, sometimes I have two minutes, so it's like the first five shots are the obvious ones, but then I do my work. And so it's just that there is a process. It doesn't necessarily mean you always ratchet up your volume. I think that can be problematic. It is for me. Um, and just having so much storage, I think there is, you know, and sometimes what I'll do is I'll bring a little compact flash card that only allows me to shoot 40 pictures. And so if I delete one, I, I'm like, oh, you know, it's so painful. But um, I think all of those things are so important in this age, like you were saying, where we can just shoot, 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 and shoot. Um, that, that, that isn't the solution. Um, I think it's maybe more mindful shooting um, mm. with different types of amounts or volumes, you know. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for sharing all that great wisdom and your photos and your techniques and yourself. I enjoyed it a lot. And yeah. I hope you come back and see us some more. Heck yeah. I'm definitely going to come back and watch the John Paul show for sure. And I, I look forward to keeping up with you guys and watching these shows. And yeah, thanks a ton for having me on. It's a real treat. Well, it's been a pleasure. I like I like not focusing so much on technique and moving off to what goes behind the photograph. It's it's a really refreshing change to a lot of the what's out there for us as as photographers and learning our craft. We have to get a little more behind it and understand who we are as photographers and what we're trying to say with it, the work we're doing. And this this has been wonderful. I just been I, I'm just really pleased. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight, and we will see you in two weeks. Who's our guest in two weeks, Ron? 
I haven't looked at the calendar. I thought you knew. Bad boy. All right. Well, it's somebody wonderful. I know because we got everything scheduled out for a long time. Yeah, we're way ahead now. <laughs> we're so lucky. We're so lucky to have that. All right. Well, Chris, go back to your recording. I hope you're not going to stay too late. It's evening there now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm done for the day, actually, after this. So I'll be heading, heading home to my family, which I'm looking forward to. Oh, cool. And your children are absolutely gorgeous. I love seeing their pictures. Yeah, yeah, they are. It is so much fun. I love, you know, obviously a lot of us, I think, who are photographers love getting to take photos of our kids and just savor those moments before they slip away. So I love that. Cool. All right, then. Bye, everyone, and thank you for joining us. And uh, those of you who are down there, you can stay on for just a minute after the broadcast ends. Bye-bye.